Welcome to the Smart Driving Cars podcast. Thanks for tuning in. This edition is sponsored by the Smart ETFs, Smart Transportation and Technology ETF, symbol MOTO. For more information, head to MOTOETF.com. I'm Fred Fishkin, along with the Faculty Chair of Autonomous Vehicle Engineering at Princeton University, Alan Kornhauser. Hi, Alan. Hey, good morning, Fred. Good morning. And we are happy to welcome Adriano Alessandrini, Professor of Transportation Engineering at the University of Florence in Italy, and author of a new book titled The Role of Infrastructure for a Safe Transition to Automated Driving. Thank you for being with us, Adriano. Thank you for inviting me. Good morning to you all, or as, as I should say, as I am uh... In Italy, good afternoon. <laughs> yes, good afternoon. Uh, n- not bad being in Florence, you know. I mean, whew, not a bad place to be. Uh, definitely, it's a beautiful place. <laughs> beautiful place. Well, let's start out with your perspective on, on where we are today, uh, Adriano, when it comes to the development and deployment of automated vehicles. What's your assessment? Well, I think that we have uh, demonstrated that there is enough technology to actually bring automated vehicles on uh, some roads, many roads, but it's not yet enough technology. And probably this is my assessment. It is not for um, in a short time, there won't be enough technology to actually bring automated vehicle everywhere. So my perspective is that we should start deploying automated vehicles where it is actually possible doing it. And you've been involved in demonstration projects through the years that have really shown how this can be useful. Yes, I remember the first demonstration we made, it was uh, in a beautiful place in the Côte d'Azur in the south of France on the Quai des Millionaires in Antibes, it was 2003. And uh, the laser, uh, the single laser of our automated vehicles cost $100,000. <laughs> so, uh, the, the, the great difference no. today is, is that you can spend uh, less than 1000 to get the same laser, an even better one. And this is what really changed. Well, may I add, I think something else changed between that and since I'm sort of a vision guy, the amount of processing and our capability to do things with vision might not be completely everything that we want. But my goodness, <laughs> compared to what we could do in 2003 or, or what we did at the DARPA challenge in 2005, that actually worked pretty darn well. But, you know, I mean, it's it's so many orders of magnitude better. Well, yes, today. yes, yes. Technological improvements have been fantastic. And uh, I mean, don't get me wrong, I am a technologically enthusiast person. The point is, I don't believe that everything, every changes should be just entrusted to technology. Uh, what is really, really important is another thing you said, is the vision. When you look at, at what Waymo has been doing in, in Chandler, Arizona, how do you assess that? And uh, in Europe, is there, are you looking for something similar? Well, we did something similar. Uh, uh, we did demonstrations. Uh, then the, we have a legal problem in actually allowing uh, fully automated vehicles with no person on board to actually uh, operate a real service. So as long as you pay uh, a safety steward to be on board, the system is no longer profitable and when the subsidy ends, uh, the demonstrator ends. But we have demonstrated something similar since long time ago. Uh, My my project, City Mobile 2, has carried 100,000 passengers in uh, seven uh, European cities, in the city center of seven European cities between 2014 and 2016. uh, Don't get me wrong, naturally, way more technology is way better than the technology we used. eh? I mean, I'm not saying we wear any clothes to their level of technology. I'm just saying that the kind of service which has been demonstrated is there. And then there is a huge problem of responsibility and with responsibility goes uh, the legal framework because you need to have somebody who's crazy enough to get responsibility for uh, uh, operating a system that if it kills uh, somebody, then you are responsible for it. There is no longer 
the scapegoat of the driver who takes the blame. It's you. Uh, Adriano, that is extremely well said by you. I agree with you 100%. The, the big hurdle here is, is for whoever makes the decisions and is, it takes on the responsibility. I've, I've written it many times with respect to Elon. You know, he can go say he has full self-driving. Uh, and but he has to also say if anything happens that's that's um, that's anything bad it's on him you know he's not only going to send people into space he's going to pick up the tab it's going to be his responsibility and until he's 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 going to do that then you know uh, uh, we're all stuck with reading the fine print what has amazed me and is that is that in Chandler Waymo Alphabet did decide, has decided to put vehicles out there without an attendant, as best as I can understand it. I haven't been there. I'll blame it on, on COVID that I couldn't travel, but that's not really, really, you know, I haven't been there, but apparently they don't have somebody, you know, a, a safety driver riding in a car behind it, or they don't have a, a seat on top of the, behind their LIDAR that a safety driver is hiding back there, or, you know, all these videos that one sees going down, you know, who knows what Chinese streets showing people, you know, driverless. I mean, you know, there it's all smoke and mirrors. Apparently they're doing it without the smoke and mirrors and somebody through that whole chain of command has said, you know, if any, if an Elaine Herzberg incident happens, it's on them, I guess. Right. Well, they, they've been on the program with us uh, talking about that decision. And we've had passengers, uh, a passenger anyway, come on with us talking about it. Yeah. It is for real that they are doing this. So, right, Adriana? But it, within a limited operational design domain. Obviously. Well, of course it's within a limited operational design domain. I don't have to get into our, our storm that we had when people were putting up cones. Don't go, you know, drive down the street because your car will float. And guess what? When it floats, you don't have it. You no longer have traction. The wheels turn, but you don't move because there's no normal force force to take, take the friction. And so helicopters had to come in and rescue people and their cars were trashed and you know, yeah, of course there are operational design. There will always, I mean, everywhere is not everywhere, or at least, you know, the, the, the advertisements on, you know, on TV, you know, show who knows what kind of car climbing the, the Chinese great wall. Okay, great. You know, I mean, really sure. Adriano. <laughs> You know, <laughs> you know. I, I remember uh, the, the first demonstrator for which I was uh, the responsible guy was the 2014 demonstration in Oristano, alongside the beach in Sardinia. Beautiful uh, place. There were two vehicles uh, unmanned. Uh, there were there was a supervision center, but I mean the vehicles were fully yeah. automated. Yeah. And in Italy, there is this uh, this law which basically allow a university professor to take responsibility for anything he wants to, to test on the road. So it, it puts a license plate with his name on, and whatever the, the vehicle does, it's his responsibility. So I did that. And then I spent the entire summer 2014 in the US because there is no extradition. <laughs> so... <laughs> Uh, uh, well, you know, I, I, I must admit that I did something similar in the, in the 2005 DARPA challenge. We were, we were going down, um, down the streets of Las Vegas, you know, and I, I was behind the wheel, okay, of the thing going down there. But guess what? It wasn't registered. Actually, GM had given it to us and we were supposed to completely disassemble. It was never supposed to see this, see a street again. It, it, it was uninsured. It was, it, it didn't even have a license plate. It had a Princeton plate in place of a license plate. And I guess I said, holy hell, if something happens, I'm going with a vehicle. So who cares? <laughs> I'm the responsible guy. Oh, well, anyway. Yeah. No, but the, the, this, this is, this is fun, but it's actually, sorry, this is fun, but this is actually a very crucial point. Because a very it, it crucial. Op 
it all ends up to who is the responsible person for any criminal responsibility. Because, I mean, the civil liability, this is something you can deal with insurances and other things. But criminal responsibility, it's on you. There is nothing else you can do. Uh, unless we have a president that basically lets you off. Never mind. We won't go there either. <laughs> In your book, you're saying that road modifications are needed for safety today and for automated vehicles. What kinds of changes are, are you talking about here? Give us, a, give us a, a bit more of what you're writing about in the book. Yeah, well, the, the easy uh, summary of all this uh, is that uh, we say that the accidents are a responsibility of the human driver, and they are, but they, they are not the only one responsible. They are the one which are held accountable for. But the design of the infrastructure, the way in which it is maintained, the way in which other users use it, uh, and also the uh, behavior of all the others that forces you, force you as a driver to behave in a way which is not uh, as you should have, uh, these are all things that contribute to the accidents. And unless you redesign the infrastructure to prevent this thing to happen, to really ensure that the infrastructure is usable only in a safe way, it is very difficult for the automated vehicle to negotiate its way safely. It is always possible to make a safe automated vehicle, but it will happen to be standstill. It will happen to be always stuck. If you want the automated vehicle to, to ride and to ride at high speed, then you, you need to give it the right width, the, the right uh, uh, dimension of the infrastructure. You need to give the right visibility. You need to give it a number of things, which are also the same things which are needed to ensure safety for a human driver. For example, if you have a blind curve, if you have a blind curve, it means that you need to slow down because you never know what, what's after the curve. And yet there is not today in the infrastructure the necessary measure in place to force you to slow down. And if there are no this measure to force you to slow down and you slow down, all the other vehicles following you will try to overtake, will try to push you to not slow down. But actually this is a blind curve. So the point is that the infrastructure needs to be designed in a way which is not only safe, but which is absolutely understandable that certain behavior are essential to be safe. There is always the, the example of a vehicle stuck in a, in a, uh, on a lane and uh, whether or not the automated vehicle should be allowed to invade the other carriageway and pass the, the, the stopping vehicle. Actually, this is something that we do every day as manual drivers, but this is something that shouldn't be done because this is what causes accidents. Now, if we want to solve all these things, then we need to take care of the way in which infrastructures are misused and why their design allow them to be misused. And this is what it is, the, the kind of interventions that need to be done on infrastructures. Well, uh, Adrian, on that point, you said it in the beginning, you know, all these things would help us when we drive with our eyes and whatever we use to drive. I guess I do have a LIDAR right here, so I use my LIDAR, <laughs> but never mind. Um, you know, but. But, Especially you know, when but, you but, use your, your eyes for texting. Yeah, but, but you know, <laughs> the, this is, I think, you know, we've said this, we've said this for years, you know, kind of the first thing on the infrastructure, you got to have at least good paint. Okay, you know, there's the Hawaiian crash in the, in the Tesla on 101. I mean, my goodness, the diverged part, the lines and so on. If I would have driven that, I wouldn't know which line to follow. It was such a mess and, and so on. So, of course, it's the system did it. And in fact, what took out the 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 uh, the, the the crash, the uh, the absorbing uh, element was a crash 
you know, two weeks earlier by by a human driver who couldn't figure out what the heck was going on because California Department of Transportation paint on 101 was bad. Okay, I mean, you know, those kinds of things and those are absolutely. And then, as you say, I mean, some of these situations, uh, the, the, the road leading to Death Valley goes like this. Okay, and you go up the hill and you can't see what's over the crest. OK, so really, you, you really can't drive it more than really 30 miles an hour. The hell, it's in the middle of the desert. You don't expect anybody. Boom, man, you're going to like 90. Holy hell, up over the hill. You don't know what's down on the other side. What? <laughs> yes, yes, you, you are right. The, the point is uh, uh, the infrastructure needs also to force the right behavior on drivers. Because otherwise an automated vehicle will, will either be forced to behave as the other human drivers do, because imagine to have an automated vehicle at 30 miles when all the others are driving at 90. I mean, it means that it's, it's a bottleneck, it's a moving bottleneck. And after all, I mean, I'm not sure about it, but from what I heard, the initial Waymo test were done with the very respectful uh, vehicles, which happened to be rear-ended quite a lot. Yes, because, yes. Because nobody actually believed that uh, just because there was a cyclist there, uh, the vehicle would have stopped. I mean, yeah. because the human driver doesn't stop because there is a, a, a cyclist uh, close. It, it does only if the, the cyclist is already under the wheel. Otherwise, <laughs> uh, otherwise he continues to, 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 to drive on it. And I mean, everybody expected the automated vehicle to behave like this. So you either teach the automated vehicle to be as irresponsible as the human driver are today, or you have to teach the human driver to behave normally, but uh, normally, correctly. How do you teach human driver to behave correctly? By doing infrastructures better. And this means, of course, the right painting. It, it means, of course, the right measures it means it might mean also that if you want to keep a speed on after uh, a hill and you don't see what's after the crest you might put a sensor after the crest and you might actually send the signal from the sensor on the street to my vehicle and i can actually see uh, the information but in this case and we go back to the responsibility part then the owner and the manager of the infrastructure share a huge part of the responsibility in crashes, which today they don't do. So it's very difficult for them to actually say, yes, I do accept this part of the responsibility. Because even if I make a, a system, vehicle, infrastructure, human, they are all part of the same system. If I make the system safer, it still means that a part, a small part of a smaller number of accidents, by the part, it is blamed on the infrastructure, which today they are not. So why would they want that? They, they, they don't. They don't. Yeah, and, they don't. And they don't. And in, in a sense, you know, they do put up a speed limit. And every once in a while, they put up some police to sort of regulate that speed limit. But, but that's, the, and it's, that's but for this, other reasons. That's for revenue generation as opposed to... But this doesn't work with automated vehicles. If you really want automated vehicles, because the automated vehicles do have the potential to help improving safety. They sure. do have the potential to help improving mobility. And they do have the possibility even to improve economy. So they have three major pillars, which our politicians should be really glad to push. Absolutely. Because these are three really important things. But in order to have automated vehicles on the road, then you need to actually discuss with the road managers and explain that they need to, to take part of the responsibility. Then you need to actually understand how to m blame some of the accidents on car makers, which is something they, of course, don't want to do. And this is, this is the real problem of automated vehicles. Who is responsible? Who's going to pay for what? And it and it sounds to a great deal like you're you're saying that government needs to take the lead here that the the politicians have to be making the decisions, but more than even the the industries involved in, in building the automated vehicles. 
Well, this is this is my firm belief. I mean, the the industry does have uh, the the rightful the rightful uh, policy of uh, looking at their uh, uh, shareholders. So at looking at things that make them profitable and and uh, and which is which is good. It's right. I mean, it's the principle of capitalism. But the politician has also the the, the it is mandated to actually look at the big picture. At not only at the profit part, but looking at the welfare of the people, at the social part, looking at the environment, looking at the uh, livability of an environment. And these are all things that can, of course, be improved a lot by automated vehicles, as long as automated vehicles are implemented in a certain way. But it needs the, a, a view, a vision of a politician to actually start pushing in this direction. If we wait for uh, an industry to say, yes, yes, I want to sell a product so that I can take the blame for 10% of the road accidents which exist today, nobody will do it. Because no matter how many vehicles you sell, no matter how many, uh, uh, how many trips if you sell mobility instead of, of vehicles, how many trips you sell, no matter how much is the, the revenues of the business. If then you have to take the blame for all uh, the, the, the deaths and, and the, the destruction that has caused today by the, by the road accidents, then nobody will. So that's the reason why you need to actually envision a system which is infrastructure, vehicle, people, so all together, which can actually be conceived to be safe as it is today, for example, for automated rails. Rails have gone to automation long before than, than, than road. And this is because they were capable of keeping the pillars together. Yeah, also because they had uh, a, an easier path to segregate. But this is another point. Alan? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think it, it requires all this to, to be... A... The, 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 to me, the, the, the problem is that we're we always talk about the 90 percent of, of, of crashes have human involvement and so on. I, I call it 90 percent of the crashes human misbehavior. It's misbehavior. It's misbehavior. It's we cross the double line when we shouldn't. We go in the we go past somebody when there's somebody heading down the down the down the road towards us. And of course we have a head on. We don't stay in the lane. We fall asleep. We go on our phones. We have too much uh, adult beverages. We take whatever. We fall asleep. We check out who knows what over here and over there. We scratch our butts. All, you know, all those things are misbehaviors by the individual. And so and 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 or we we tailgate or we road rage and all those things and that, you know and and that has to be we we need a system that can can basically give you a get out of jail free card and save your butt when you misbehave and say cool it i mean that's what i've always argued with respect to to uh analog brakes and electronic stability control you know when i when i slam on my brakes and that's not and and the uh, the the braking system says hey alan you're stupid here that's not the way that you're going to really avoid this thing i'm taking over get the hell out of the way i'm doing it or i go around a curve too fast and i'm about to lose my rear end it's a uh, cool it. i'm taking over the throttle the braking the da da do da 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 to keep my rear end from you know we need more of these systems that whenever we go misbehave bails us out this is why i've always pushed the automated emergency braking stuff holy macro just work up to 25 miles an hour what about at 70 what about at 90 that's when i really need it all of a sudden some and, and they said whoa i don't know well well we're doing crash mitigation we're gonna just save your life we're we're where your legs are gone i mean you know whatever it's just Anyway, what do you think, Adriano? <laughs> uh, the, the problem is responsibility again. Uh, the point is that uh, if you give, in, the, in those conditions, control to uh, an automated or function uh, uh, of whatever kind, then uh, who's responsible at that point for the crash that will happen? 
Uh, it's my fault because I first uh, drove into something or is the fault of the system which didn't prevent me to crash? Because that's, that's the, the huge point. Huh? The, 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 there is no system which can save uh, a crash if uh, there are not enough uh, room and there is not enough uh, sure. uh, and I didn't slow down or there is not enough grip to actually okay. make the braking, so that there is no system which can prevent all uh, accidents. And what you call misbehavior, I agree, it's misbehavior. But you know, I'm Italian. I'm used. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm used to misbehave by definition. If, if I if I, you know that an Italian is misbehaving when driving because he turned the, the ignition on. Okay. <laughs> okay. I, I may be biased on this. I I, I agree. But I just think that what you call misbehave is the normal behavior. And, oh, and it, I mean, I, I, it I, is I, normal. I, I've, yeah. I've been traveling in, in, in your car with you driving <laughs> long, long enough to know that you happen to misbehave at times. I'm Italian. I, I'm not French. I'm Italian. <laughs> it may be, but I mean, may I, be. I, I mean, it's uh, uh, and I've been I've been driving on, on the, the, the U.S. motorways to see a lot of uh, trucks uh, speeding and uh, I mean misbehavior is, is, is normal and actually misbehavior is what it is expected if you have yeah. somebody who misbehaved because he parked in the wrong place then you will have a, a thousand of people misbehaving because they overtake the parked car <laughs> what, what is the right behavior at that point that the first car just stop there and wait for the police to remove the illegally parked car yeah. because that, that, double parked that, <laughs> because that person is going to be killed, eh? but, yeah, but not, not, not in an accident. Because the other uh, drivers go, we will go around with 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 a, with a rifle. I mean, that's 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 the point. I mean, the concept is the infrastructure should be made in a way to force this kind of behavior to be uh, safe, no longer to allow this kind of misbehavior which are, after all, the normal behavior of people. And the other thing which is absolutely crucial is that while misbehaving, most of the misbehavior we are discussing actually improve the performances of the road. We Italians are crazy enough to drive at 120 kilometers per hour, which is uh, uh, close to 80 miles an hour. Uh, the uh, at one second headway, if you break, and I mean, I, of course I'm going to rear end, of course I'm going to crash into you. And, but this allowed the uh, main uh, motorway around Rome, which is called the Grande Raccordo Ulare, the, the great uh, road ring, uh, to actually be able to carry 3,000 vehicles per lane per hour. 3,000. Okay, if I behave correctly, which means a three-second headway, it will be 1,000. So I, I, would lose, I would lose two lanes every one. <laughs> every lane I lose, I lose two-thirds of the capacity. I mean, uh, that's impossible. Imagine what happened in Rome, but I mean, imagine what happened in Los Angeles. I mean, it's, uh, I mean okay, we, we misbehave in Italy, it's true, but I mean, in Los Angeles, uh, there, there, there are no... Uh, piece of cake. I mean, <laughs> the point is infrastructure has also the role of preventing. It. Are you advocating that the infrastructure there in Italy be changed to prevent that kind of uh, speed, or not, not just in Italy? I think everywhere infrastructures have have been uh, designed in a way in which uh, the speed limit are uh, not really. Uh, respectable. I mean, I'm, in the book, there are a few examples in which there are uh, crashes which have been blamed on on uh, on drivers, and actually the infrastructure is, is terrible. There is a, a, a motorway, urban motorway in Italy. Okay, the speed limit says 50 kilometers per hour. Okay, so it means uh, um, uh, 30 miles an hour uh, speed limit. But there is nobody who actually drives under uh, under 80, and most of them drive at 100 kilometers per hour, so twice as much. 
because it's, uh, I mean, it's an infrastructure with three lanes. Each lane uh, is three meters wide. So, I mean, it is a motorway. And then it ends up on a traffic light. It's normal that people get killed while crossing on put that traffic light. And, and when you blame the driver because he, he I mean, it is the, 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 the fault of the driver. No, no, no discussion about that. But every single driver on that infrastructure behaved the same stinky way as the one that killed the, the girls, okay? The girls crossing. And this is absolutely, and, and it is the infrastructure that needs to be modified so to prevent this kind of behavior. Once you have an infrastructure which prevents you to speed up that way, it makes sense to have an automated vehicle which respects the speed limit. If today you put an automated vehicle which respects the speed limit, you will have a moving bottleneck. You will have people overtaking it from left, right, and even from above. We'll be back with more, but first, this is a good time to remind you about our sponsor, the Smart ETFs, Smart Transportation and Technology ETF, symbol MOTO. To get more info, head to MOTOETF.com. On the website, we should point out it's a good idea to read the white paper. It's called The Smart Transportation Revolution. It's under the Insights and News tab. Some great information there to help you make informed decisions. You may know that ETFs can be a smart way to spread risk with investments, maybe focus on a particular category of stocks. The website, again, is MOTOETF.com. We're back with more of the Smart Driving Cars podcast and our guest, a wonderful guest, Adriano Alessandrini from the University of Florence. Adriano, I'll let you, I'll let you pick up where, where you left off here just a little bit. So are you saying that the implementation of automated vehicle mobility needs to wait until we see some really significant and would take long-term changes in infrastructure? No, no, I'm on the contrary. I say that uh, if we wait for uh, uh, the everything to be ready uh, before we deploy, uh, there will be no way in which we will deploy. This is a vicious circle and we need to break it somewhere. No, no, my point is another one. We need to create the demand for a new mode of transportation, which is uh, uh, moving on automated vehicles, and uh, this is, uh, we can start specifically on some uh, places. Uh, for example, the outskirts of a, of a large city in which today using um, shared transport services is, uh, is very difficult, is uh, using public transport almost impossible. But you can start creating uh, services which can attract significant share of demands with minimal uh, help from uh, automation, help mostly used to relocate empty vehicles when needed and uh, to help uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, safety. But then, I mean, we need to create the demand for the people to actually, we will want to leave their private manual car and use shared automated vehicles. If this starts, and to start, and I go back to the, uh, to the industry and to the, um, uh, the profitability of the things, of course, we need to demonstrate services. We need to start with services that can actually be profitable because we definitely need the private investors to put their money into these new forms of transportation and get uh, money out of it, not to lose money. So we don't need to wait for subsidies. We don't need to wait for uh, the public investments. We need to go there and do it where it is possible, so in, in those uh, specific areas. And then once we have such a large part of the demand which moved away from the use of private personal car and started using these services, you can start taking away some of the capacity that exists on the road infrastructure to actually create high-speed corridors for automated vehicles. And this will generate the virtuous circle that will create more and more communities, societies, villages, quarters, 
who will want to invest in new forms of mobility, creating then the opportunity for more and more people to move in a different way. And this is what can guide uh, the, the, the revolution, because the difference from, uh, I know, uh, Tesla or, or Waymo is that they are, of course, demonstrating beautiful technology, but technology which is not ready to be transferred everywhere. But if I simplify the environment, any technology from Waymo, from Tesla, and even from any of our research labs can do and can do it very well. And this is how things can change from my perspective. While waiting for this to improve, of course, we need to start, start. We already have started, but we need to continue investing on the infrastructures to make the infrastructure safer. This is something that whether or not automated vehicles will become real, it's, it's absolutely necessary to do because it saves lives. And if automated vehicles will come real in a short time, then having made the better infrastructures will also help automated vehicles to actually move on this safer, certifiably safer infrastructure. Well, I, I, Adriano, I agree with you completely. I just go back even earlier than you we're back to an earlier start because we're really, we haven't even started yet, okay? And, and, and you know, what you said about we do it first in the outskirts or in the smaller communities rather than in the downtowns of Rome, of Manhattan. I mean, whatever, they have a subway. Man, Manhattan doesn't need, need this. They, they have a way to get around. But I think um, you know my class on on um, on Mon on on Wednesday. Uh, Robin Chase uh, put up a slide that that really uh, brought it home. You know, it, right now, she said, right now, even right now, there are 180 million Americans that don't have access to a car. 180. We have 340 million, more than 50 percent. So everybody that's 16 and under, everybody that's 85 and over, everybody that 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 has that's in a two household family where there's one car. And she said, well, you know, she implied she didn't have the car. Her husband had it, you know, um, you know, all those situations where you have, you know, five household families and two cars, three don't, you know, or many households. And, and in a sense, this, we should be, we should be starting out to address the mobility of, a, of those that don't have access to a car and provide them with a better quality mobility. As you pointed out in the suburbs, the bus service is, um, we won't if you don't have anything good to say about it you don't say anything so i won't say anything um you know and and provide mobility and in fact you know that's where i've ended up you know being laser focused and and i and you know we we've, we've we've been i don't know how long i've been trying to get new jersey to to um to create a welcoming environment for this technology, because so far I don't, I don't know. I think um, autonomous, uh, autonomous stuff brought a vehicle, and um, and um, local motors brought a vehicle to my summits. I think they're the only two uh, driverless vehicles that have ever been in New Jersey. I mean, somehow the the, the industry is totally, um, and and for for good reason because we we didn't have a welcoming environment. I think we finally have a welcoming environment in New Jersey, and that comes from the top all the way down, as well as at the grassroots. And, and, and where do we have that? We have that in the state capital of Trenton. And if you go to Trenton, what makes Trenton different than, than Chandler, which is a you know, suburb, is in Chandler, 70% of the households have two or more cars. In Trenton, 70% of the households have one or fewer. OK, the mobility opportunity for Trentonians 
And in fact, if you start with an operational design domain that is well restricted, but provides mobility, car-like mobility, Uber-like mobility, Lyft-like mobility, but the problem with Uber and Lyft is it's expensive because of the driver. No, or it's cheap if you're willing to do it on the back of the driver and not pay them and assume that they do it for free and so on, you know, then it's cheap, okay? But if really those folks that deserve to earn a living wage, you know, are paid a living wage, then the thing is so expensive that in fact, the people of Trenton, many of them can't afford it. And so it's not at the beginning taking people out of cars, it's providing mobility to them providing equity to them with this. And this is what we're about to launch in, in Trenton. And, and we're going to invite the industry to come here. We're going to invite them to bring 100 vehicles. We're going to invite them to serve 50 kiosks in Trenton, provide mobility in a, in a very small area of eight square miles, and provide 12 by 24 by 350 service. And why 350 and not 365? Hey, 15, if you do a good service for 350 days a year, you deserve two weeks vacation. Okay, seriously, we're not trying to solve the, 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 the problem of fog, the problem of snow up to here, the problem of, of rain that is the, the flooded streets. No, stay home. Okay, let's start and solve a problem of what normal days I've just got. Instead of it taking me uh, an, an hour and 45 minutes to travel from my home to a, to a $15 an hour job at, at an at a Amazon distribution center, it now is 18 minutes. My goodness, do that and just do it 350 days a year. And why only 12 hours right now is because we're going to put up the money to pay for the million hours, person hours, or is it billion? I forgot. Whatever the number, 250 attendants in 100 vehicles for two years to basically get the safety down and get the acclimation of the people to this. You have to acclimate the people there's a sociological problem here that, that people, I mean, yeah, oh, I'll jump in. Look, my hands are out. I mean, it's a sideshow. It, it deserves to have a tent, you know, at a, at, a, at a carnival. I mean, we've been carnivaling this stuff as opposed to making it. I, I just want it to take me to work, take me to synagogue, take me, take me to, to church, uh, take me to, uh, to a mosque, take me to, you know, play softball, take me to my friend, you know, the, the fundamental mobility of what a society in a moderately dense, you know, let's do the easy one first, not out in, 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 in Chandler where holy hell, the only thing you can do is, is make it, you know, a trinket that somebody sort of looks at, then they go back to driving their car, you know, somebody that could really benefit their quality of life could benefit. What do you think, Adriano? When, uh, well, I think that when you open uh, these, these new demonstration, call me up. I will uh, come to be a cheerleader. I'm not as, uh, as beautiful as a cheerleader should be, but I will do my best with, with the voice uh, to try and, and, and say how I love it. Well, you, you, can, you can come. We're going to do it. We're going to do the summit. We're going to do the summit of November 16th uh, through, the, through the 18th. We're going to roll this thing out. This thing is real. And, and now we're going to see whether or not any technologist really wants to come in and do this. This is, this is mobility. This, isn't, this is providing mobility to people who desperately need it, who have been left behind by the car, who have been left behind by people going 90 miles an hour down the New Jersey turnpike and crap like that and so on and so forth. This is providing real value. And if we're successful there, guess what? It will explode throughout New Jersey. It will come to Princeton. It will come to Mays Landing. Why? If because, indeed, huh? Go ahead. If indeed uh, the, the, the possibility traveling from Europe to U.S. 
will be open again, I will be there in November because I really love the idea. My point is just this. What you are proposing is absolutely necessary, but is absolutely at a loss from the financial perspective, which means that this uh, needs to be subsidized and heavily. And, uh, the, the, and there is no perspective to actually have it uh, at a profit, not even when you remove the, uh, the driver, because moving by car, even in a shared car, uh, does cost. Uh, today, when you move in your own car, you don't actually notice it because you, you paid most of the prices up front and you just uh, realize how much gas costs. But when you actually put together the price of uh, buying a vehicle, the price of uh, maintaining it, the price of insurance, the price of uh, everything else, then the single miles travel costs quite a bit. Uh, now, the point uh, of all this is, I agree, there, there is uh, a, a part uh, of, the, uh, of the population which is without mobility, but if they cannot afford the car, then they cannot afford mobility. And they will always need to have subsidies from the government in order to get it. Now, if you want to make a commercial success out of this, you need to go somewhere first where you actually get money out of it. And, uh, for example, the Bay Area of San Francisco is already uh, a, a place in which you might start because there is already plenty of people who use public transport to go to the city center of San Francisco, but they have no way of traveling the last mile to the BART stop. Okay, as it is, for example, in New Jersey, for people commuting to Manhattan, but then driving their cars and parking in those ugly parking buildings alongside the stations, which are uh, along the railroad uh, to, uh, to New York, uh, uh, all single stop has plenty of this parking. And these are the places in which you can actually convince people that instead of buying a vehicle, which you keep parked eight hours a day or even more, 12 hours a day in one of these parking uh, and, and paying for all this, you might actually pay for a ride. And this is where you can make money out of it. Once you make money out of it, everything will become cheaper. The sensors will become cheaper. The software will become cheaper. Everything will become cheaper. And then it's much easier to give cheaper service to Trenton. It will always need subsidies, but much less. Now, I, I am, I mean, I am European. I have a different mentality. I am used to see subsidized transport. So, I mean, I... I share your view. I'm just worried that once you start giving for free a subsidized transport, people will start believing that this is actually a free service. When you actually buy a ticket for the, for the metro in, in Paris, one of the most extensive and beautiful metro network in the world is in Paris, probably second to Tokyo and few others, but I mean, Paris is really beautiful, not very clean but beautifully uh, built. Now, you actually expect that the ticket costs one euro. No, it costs to you one euro fifty. But then the, the French state puts three euros more into the single ticket they sold you. And you are used to think that this service costs one euro fifty. And when you go to London and find out that the same ticket in London costs five times as much, you, you, are, you are scared. You say, how is it possible that London is so expensive? No, it's just because in London you are paying for what you get. In Paris, it's the French state that pays for you and you don't even know. Now, my point with this is we cannot afford to have mobility, universal mobility for everybody paid by the state, whatever state, unless we become some sort of socialist economy which didn't work out that well, as far as I remember. So the point is, we need to be able to actually convince people to pay for what they get. And the people who will start paying for what they get is people who can afford it, people who do need it, so people who actually already spend money, already commute, already are uncomfortable 
with, with using their car and in situations in which these things are technically feasible and not too difficult. Because when you start taking an entire city center, even of a small state capital, but still a state capital, it's a lot of investment to make it right. Because you need to make sensors on, on every single traffic light. And when you start putting sensors on every uh, traffic light, it costs a lot of money. So my point is, why don't you start in Princeton? In uh, Princeton oh, to actually go to Princeton Junction. Because uh, this is, there's a lot of demand <laughs> of people coming, especially, you know, four eight professors landing, I don't know, in Newark Airport and getting a train uh, in Newark and finding themselves trapped yeah. in Princeton Junction. I mean, any, any personal reverence is, of course, uh, uh, purely, uh, uh, well, no. however, I mean. Adriano, you're going to get me in so much trouble because you're asking me these questions, and I'm, I may have to, and I'm going to answer them. <laughs> uh, the way I'm going to deal with Princeton, with dealing for Princeton to Princeton Junction is I want to buy the dinky and run it. OK, uh, there is a beautiful train that runs back and forth. It's mismanaged and misrun run by New Jersey Transit. I want to buy it. I want to run it. I want to run the demand uh, demand responsibly. In other words, meet every train at Princeton Junction. And we'll do that with that train. We can do it with train. We don't need it, whatever. The reason why I don't want to do it in Princeton is because everybody in Princeton, or not everybody, people like me, we have two drivers in my family and we have four cars. I mean, what the hell? I need one of these things. I mean, somebody's going to go and 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 provide me the come on, I'll I'll use I'll use it and and if it is not perfect, it, and you you don't know that that how good it's gonna to need to be to be better than what I can provide for myself, I am just going to, no, the place, and, and if that approach worked, then Waymo right now would be going through the roof, okay? The fact, the fact that Waymo, basically, in Chandler, since they started, You've seen no, I've seen nothing to say, oh my goodness, the demand, everybody, come, we can't, we can't, oh my goodness, we've got to put, none of that. Why? Because they've gone to the carnival, they've, they've seen the, you know, the, 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 the adjoined twins, and they said, oh, I got it better at home. I paid for the car. I don't, you know, my goodness, they are sticking their nose up to this thing. They've had their thrill. And they run. We, I think if we have a European this, way of doing this, you know, what, which is, which is you, you start putting on limited traffic zones. So you can't access the zone with your own car. Yeah, and yeah, then, well, of then, course, then yeah. So, reserve, and, and then and you're get, going to reserve parking. And, and guess and what? Then, I mean, you are, and you guess are pushing what? more and, guess and more what? people to you use You don't get reelected as mayor of Chandler. You don't get reelected. Maybe, maybe when, 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 when uh, the, the Ken where, Livingstone, where? when Ken Livingstone was uh, uh, the uh, far left uh, hand mayor of London decided to put the congestion charging, he had to fight against his own Labour Party, because they, they all told him you are suicidal and you're not just suiciding yourself, you are suiciding ourselves with you. Yeah. Bec yeah. And instead, he got re-elected. Instead, the congestion charging survived even Boris Johnson. Because, yeah, no, uh, yeah, because, the, po because the point is that when something works, it works. Then you will not remember anymore the, uh, what was before. Now you're right on one yeah. thing. To work, you really need to work well. But you, that's why I say that instead of trying and doing it fully automatically from the beginning, what you really need to do is to relocate empty vehicles automatically. Then once the passenger is on board, allow him to drive. I don't have problems with the, with the passenger driving. As but I'm 15 as years old. Well, I'm not allowed if, to drive. If, if the vehicles, I don't if have the, a driver's license. If the vehicles are I, I, shared, if the vehicles are shared, 
the 15 years old can go with a uh, with a, with an old uh, seventh year old pedophile. No problem. No, I'm joking. I, no, 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 no. I, 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 no, I know, I know. Well, but but the, the, you got to start someplace. Alan, how do, you, how do you address his question about uh, whether or not this can be done, even fully automated, without an attendant, without a subsidy? Do, do you buy it? Oh, I don't think, I don't, I didn't say without a subsidy. I didn't say, I didn't say that. I said, I said, when you, when you finally can pull the driver, then the, the cost is going to go down. Okay. And the scale and everything else, da, 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 the costs go down. All right. Some people do require the subsidy. No problem. Except the subsidy. I, I haven't gone through the numbers, but my expectation, if you go to the amount of subsidy that goes to run the bus service in Trenton, it's enough to be able to subsidize this operation once you have in Trenton once you have it, so that the operator that's in there doing it is profitable and now has the incentive to expand this out to Princeton and not come and serve me, where at least my, my next door neighbor will dish out the money. I might not because I'm cheap guy, but, you know, and go and, and really go. This is an opportunity a, to start a, very, a market. Okay? It's, a very, it's a very long discussion, which uh, we will do whenever you want. But uh, in Europe, we have a very, very strong uh, uh, experience with subsidizing public transport. And uh, not all of them are positive. Uh, subsidizing public transport is important, yes. but, but needs to be done in, under very carefully controlled uh, conditions. If you just put the money out of buses to actually uh, subsidize a service like the one in Trenton, you risk that then the private operator will still prioritize uh, corridors where uh, it can get money and instead refusing calls in, in places where uh, uh, it's no longer profitable to go. No, so no, no. But that, uh, that, that won't happen. Why? Because it has to be a public-private partnership. And if you want to come to Trenton, if you want to come to New Jersey and build a business... We are going to watch over your shoulder to make sure that, that the equity of the service you offer is indeed what we invited you to come to New Jersey and do. If it isn't that, it's not free will. It's not, hey, Uber, come in here and, and, and we'll lawyer up. No. no. I, remember, I, no. Remember the no. I remember the experiment. I remember of Lyft in Boston with, uh, with the corridors uh, of the shared uh, yeah. rides of Lyft, which after all ended up competing against buses. Because yeah. the man, I mean, everyone who goes uh, in uh, somewhere for, uh, 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 to, 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 to make profit out of it is interested in uh, those uh, uh, to serve, uh, to, to, to supply a service uh, where there is a, a high demand concentration. Elsewhere, <laughs> elsewhere is much less interesting. So <laughs> my point, my point is, is different. My point is we should start in places where demand is already there and where people are ready to pay. Uh, so that's where I, di I differ with you. We have to go where demand is already there and where demand is already there are people that are forced to take the bus because they don't have anything better. And that's the, that's the demand that's sitting there that will then elevate them, that will then improve their quality of life, that it's worth going in there and investing in them because it, it will improve their quality, it will improve New Jersey. That's the argument to go in there and take that. And once you do that, then you can do these other things too. 
then you have the opportunity. You know, you don't have to do lift in Boston to, to understand what Jitneys did. Jitneys did those things in Los Angeles in the in the twenties, in the you know, hundred years ago. You know, everybody knew that where are you going to run a jitney? You're going to run it along the best corridors of of the trolley lines, right? And pick up because you you provide such a better service than than oh my good what look at bus service. I mean, it it has a few points that it takes you when it wants to go, not when you and I want to go. I mean, look at the mobility we have. Anytime we want to go almost anywhere, we just do it. Holy hell. Oh, my goodness. The car, the uh, the Henry Ford gave us something that, my goodness, has improved our quality of life enormously for those of us who are so fortunate to be able to afford it. But there are a whole host of folks that have been left behind. They've been absent and they haven't even been asked. They haven't been talked to. When anybody talks about, uh, you know, uh, 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 smart cities, holy mackerel, smart cities that don't have any poor. They're only the, for the top one percenters. You know, how many smart cities can you build for one percenters who don't want to live there anyway? I mean, it's like crazy. It, you, you go to one of these places and you say, what, what are these folks talking about? This, this reminds me that you told me <laughs> that this discussion was made by Robin Chase in uh, yeah. in your class at Princeton. Uh, did she yeah. still live in Paris? Yeah, yeah, she and she does. She did, she talked she talked about it, and she did come over Zoom. She's in Boston now, and she, and she said she didn't want to raise her kids in the suburbs because, of course, you know, uh, what's the highest cause of death between the ages of I don't know thirteen and and fifty five or something? It's a car, you know. So you know, whatever. It, it was great. Love Robin. I mean, she, you know. Um, anyway, yeah, yeah, she's great. But I mean, I was just pointing out that in the end. Uh, she decided to go to live to Paris. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, hey, hey, you know, I'd love to live in Paris too, you know, or Florence, you know, I mean, come well, on, Princeton's you, you, you're okay, always, May's you're Landing's welcome, okay. But, you're always you know, welcome yeah. to come uh, to Florence whenever you want. You have uh, an open invitation. Thank so. you. <laughs> Can I come too? <laughs> uh, of course, of course. And, and, and my wife, who, who's, who's, um, um, uh, art historian, of, of course, I won't have any any trouble bringing her. So Elizabeth no, but, will come. But prob you know. probably you will lose her for a few, <laughs> several days uh, when she starts doing uh, the kind of uh, digging that uh, <laughs> yeah. you will get bored after some time. I mean, uh, in, Florence, in Florence, there's a really a lot I of know. art history to, to yeah, look at. Yeah, I know. I, and I know. Well, anyway. we want to remind people, our, our viewers and listeners, that this discussion is going to continue yeah, at, this... the, at the fifth annual Princeton Smart Driving Car Summit. As you said, Alan, now it's set for mid-November. You've got the dates set. Yeah, the dates are set 16th through the 18th. Uh, they will take place in Trenton, uh, where we're trying to do this. Um, 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 I mean... <laughs> I'm still maybe that maybe the the welcoming won't be at my house. Maybe we can hold it at Drumthwacket, but the, the governor's mansion. But whatever, we'll see. When I'm trying to make that, I'm not, that, that I'm would not, be not, terrific. Whatever, but uh, but the idea is that is that is to have the people of Trenton um, attend, uh, be able to finally uh, get the sales pitches from the technologists, um, um, and maybe kick some tires. And and uh, basically the 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 Friday of the darn thing is um, in the afternoon of Friday is is for inviting everybody in Trenton where um, as I've said, maybe we'll make it into a Woodstock or something like that. I don't know. But the idea the idea is the people that we're trying to serve. We are now engaged in in, in a a a, um, a community um, uh, um, uh, involvement part where we're just asking, we're going to the Trenton Housing Authority knocking on, on, on apartment doors and asking um, people about mobility. Where, where, do they, where do they go now? How easy is it for them to go? And where would they like to go? 
not saying anything about LIDARs, SHMIDARs, WIDARs, BIDARs, uh, and so on. This isn't about the jingle jangle. This is about getting someplace to improve quality of life and understanding where Trentonians might want to go. And then once we understand that, then it's going to be very clear what the request is going to be of the technologists with the, with the LIDAR, SHMIDARs, and BIDARs. This is the mobility we want you to provide. And we're willing to pay for the attendance for two years to acclimate you and your customers to your service and give you a chance. And we're going to specify the operational design domain and the, the level of service. And we're going to put in the infrastructure improvements if we need a kiosk, if we need curb cuts, if we need improved sidewalks. And let you start here. Because we know that if you can be successful here, then my goodness, come to Lawrenceville, come to Princeton, come to Newark, come throughout New Jersey. And in New Jersey, if you look at what the operation could be, you could be providing, you know, there are in New Jersey on a typical day, there are 35 million person trips. And you can serve New Jersey transit rail operation to New York. So somebody doesn't have to take their, their, their car. And you can do that, okay? And you can have access to not three, 1% of 35 million person trips a day in New, in New Jersey. You can have access to 10, 20, maybe 30, maybe even 40%. And you can't make money on that while also serving the people of Trenton, the people of Newark, the people of Camden, the people of New Brunswick, the people of Perth Amboy. Cut it out. If that's not your business, then stay in Chandler. Things are looking up. And, and before we <laughs> I don't go, know. We, I mean, uh, well, hey, you know, we have a welcome mat out. We're welcoming people if, if you're really serious about this. But if you're interested, if the sideshow at the carnival is just fine for you, then go do sideshows at carnivals in, 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 in other places. OK, not interested. Well, we're getting real here. That's the, that's the key. I, I think. Thing. Anyway, uh, <laughs> before we go, Alan, I want to yeah. uh, I want to congratulate, uh, and we do, I guess, uh, SpaceX, Elon yeah. Musk's other company, one of his other companies, achieving another milestone, putting the Inspiration Four crew in orbit for three days, all civilians. Yeah, and it's really amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing. You know. But that, hey, I, th that, I think that's an easier problem than, than providing mobility to the folks who don't have access to cars in Trenton when you get right down to it. I mean, that is tough, as, as, as Adriano has pointed out. I mean, you've got, to, you've got to establish a network of streets in which you do it. And you don't, nice thing about Trenton, you don't have to go probably over 25 miles an hour because there's no, in, in the eight square miles of Trenton, there's almost no place where you can go over 25 miles an hour in your car anyway so at least that works and and as a beginning as a place to get started for real to provide mobility the opportunity here is to provide mobility it's not to give me more comfort and and, and convenience in my car that i buy the industry's doing that. Elon's trying to do that. You know, Daimler is trying to do it. You know, everybody, the key, key is trying to do it. Fine. Okay. What about mobility of those folks that have been left behind? Okay. And anyway, that's, <laughs> that's what it's all about. I think, it, and I think Adriano and I, we, we completely, it's getting back to what Adriano was doing, you know, 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, this is indeed a huge social issue to which automation can uh, definitely contribute positively to solve the, the issue. So um, I fully agree. I'm just saying uh, this is not the place where I would have started, but uh, if you succeed in starting from there, any, any place is good as the other. So the point is uh, we, we need to start somewhere. We need to break 
the vicious circle that says that uh, uh, automated vehicles need either to have a much better technology or uh, to have all the streets redone uh, for them beforehand. Because otherwise, uh, this, this will never happen. It never happens. We, we, we have to start the service somewhere. And uh, if, if Trenton is successful, I am the second happiest guy in the world. Yeah, and, and again, I don't want to uh, disparage Arizona or, 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 or Chandler. It is fantastic that they've done it there. And apparently, I don't know, some people claim that it's also been done in somewhere in China, maybe. I, you know, China can take care of itself, okay? We need to do it in America, in, in, the, in the US. We, we need to do that. And, and it's, it is absolutely phenomenal that, that Waymo has been able to, to actually do it for real without smoke and mirrors, okay, in Chandler. Now, you know, either Waymo or one of the others, you know, one of the others who can do it, come do it where you will actually be appreciated. People will say, oh, my goodness, this elevator is better than the stairwell because we've only had the stairwell. We haven't had an elevator before. Oh, my goodness. It's it's a whole new it's a, it, my goodness. I can. I cannot get up to the 18th floor. Again, I'm speaking horizontally, not vertically, but that's that's what exists in in, in Trenton. You know, it, for so many so many of the residents, it's what you can walk to. Okay, and then if it's really urgent, then you really dig deep and you call a taxi or you call an Uber, and it's and you do this only for the for the most the things that where you're painted in the corner and you can't do anything else. Whereas, Hey, when we have our cars, we just, Hey, we, we want to go visit a friend. We want to go out to dinner. We want to go do boom, two, two, boom, no problem. They don't have that. Now, you know, is that really improvement in quality of life? I think so. I think, you know, that's the fundamental thing of mobility, mobility, mobility is, is, correlates completely with quality of life those things gdp all those things let's provide them with some mobile instead of leaving them behind say yeah you take the bus you go in the stairwell the hell with you we're not providing i don't know Exc <laughs> sorry exciting to see things moving, it's exciting right? i don't know yeah. but uh, anyway adriano so nice to have you discuss these things we really, always have really delightful time, adriano. Huh? <laughs> it, it, it was absolutely marvelous and uh, i want thank you both very much for this opportunity hey thank you and 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 stay stay safe and and uh, we'll visit each other as soon as we can with let's hey we have to take care of this pandemic uh, that's the most important yeah. thing so i, I can really hardly wait i can hardly wait to start traveling again and to resume my habits of uh, being in uh, in the u.s and in princeton at least once a year Thank you. Well, okay. the name of the book, once again, is The Role of Infrastructure for a Safe Transition to Automated Driving by Adriano Alessandrini. Thank you to our sponsor, the Smart ETFs, Smart Transportation and Technology ETF. The ticker symbol for the ETF is MOTO, and more information is available at MOTOETF.com. You can find us at SmartDrivingCar.com. Turn there, too, for information about the summit. Also on Anchor FM, Spotify, TuneIn, Apple, Google, Spreaker, SoundCloud, wherever you get your podcasts, your smart speaker can play us too. You can find my tech reports at textination.com. I'm Fred Fishkin along with Alan Kornhauser. Thank you for listening or watching. Have a great weekend and please stay safe. Thank you. Thank you.